cows retained in 2022 have been killed in 2023. That's led to an increase in manufacturing beef, but also it means we're going to see less calves in 2024 coming through for uh, being born, also coming through for beef in 2025 as we see a little bit of rebuilding over the next, well, 12 to 24 months in the beef industry. So I think that's important to bear in mind about where what we're looking at in prices is that we haven't got a glut of calves coming through and that means we're not going to see a, a massive glut of beef to, to really pull down prices. Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and this week's episode features Rupert Claxton, Livestock Director from Jira, who gave a presentation at the Chagas National Beef Conference, giving an overview of the global beef market and highlighting the likely trends for input prices as we move into 2024. COVID is, is fading quite quickly in terms of our, our major perception of risk. Uh, but China is only a year out of COVID. So whereas the rest of us think of COVID finishing in 2022 at the very beginning of the year, China struggled with it all through last year. And we see that in their economic performance now. But otherwise, it's it's very largely managed. The next thing here is African swine fever broken into two parts. The Chinese loss of production that then spread into Vietnam, the Philippines. And we dealt with that really through 2020 and 2021. And we've been in a rebuilding phase since. And then the European African swine fever risk, where we see it continue to spread in Europe. But really, we're not talking about production loss. We're talking about trade barriers. And we see that today with the most most recent uh, national spread where it's cropped up in Sweden. Energy here representing uh, both both electricity and gas prices, notably much higher in Europe than they are elsewhere in the world because of the historic reliance on uh, on Russian gas. But nearly everywhere I go in the world at the moment, this is a challenge. And we see it squeezing uh, from both ends of the spectrum. Both both the industry has increased cost in terms of production costs, manufacturing costs, transportation. But we also see the consumer's disposable income being squeezed. And talking to the consumer, we've got to talk about inflation, inflation of our costs, but inflation of everything in the food basket. And again, it translates to the choices the consumer makes at the checkout. What do they buy? What do they go and think about? So we worry about that a lot. In terms of the countries, the issue between or the war between Israel and Gaza, as it is now, um, clearly a, a massive issue in, in the world's psychology, but not a direct issue on our cost of production today. But, and, and you know, this is one of our big question marks in the year ahead is, is what happens if this becomes a wider conflict, if it becomes a prolonged conflict? And we're obviously very nervous about the impact on the people there for sure. In terms of the industry standpoint, the um, the energy costs, and again, that knock on to the oil price. So we keep an eye on, on that and think about that in our planning. Brazil, in terms of the beef cycle, then we've seen the impacts of Brazilian. They had atypical um, BSE again this year. They overturned their ban into China very quickly. The thing we're really concerned about is Brazilian high path avian influenza. Though. What happens if they get that in their broiler industry, their chicken industry? Does that change their ability to supply low-cost chicken into the European market? Does that change the European supply picture? It will clearly change it around the world. So we watch that carefully. China has been one of the biggest buyers of beef in the world, has clearly had an impact on the outlook for beef over the last 20 years, currently is in an economic slowdown, the like of which we haven't seen in 20 years. And so we have to factor in what the Chinese are doing uh, into our outlook for beef around the world, the price they're prepared to pay, how much volume will they take off the world market? And we have to think about that in our outlook. Feed prices back from what has been a considerable high through 2022 and into the first part of 2023, but we're still not back to the low prices that we were used to in really in the, the seven or eight years running up to 2018, 19. And the expectation is that those prices will come back a bit further, but we don't go back to the lows we saw historically. Ongoing pressure from weather. There's a talk of an El Nino as we look into next year. or well, there is an El Nino. The question really is how severe is the El Nino going to be? And then on top of that, we've got to think about the bioeth, um, not the bioethanol, but the biofuel for aviation mandates that we see in the US today, which are going to put further pressure on soy prices. And then these little guys down at the bottom here, labor. We are Still struggling with labour uh, availability and costs around the world. It's not as severe as it was last year. COVID was a major driver for disruption, also for 
the inability to resupply, you know, where we we have migrant labor and it's been over in country stuck during COVID and gone home, replacing that labor was difficult. So that's settled down around the world. That's not just a problem in Ireland. I think nearly everywhere I go, we have this conversation. Labor rates are notably higher than they were pre-COVID. Um, but the rate of the rate of inflation there has slowed down. And then these guys just split outside here because they come under this the the sustainability and, and the greening threats. Um, clearly a challenge around um, how do we meet the new sustainability targets being bought in? How are they going to be introduced to the industry? Who is going to pay for them? Great work being done in Ireland to get ahead of that discussion. And we see the rest of Europe trying to understand how to follow. And then the rest of the world is at a different level. So they've become much more prevalent in our decision making uh, this year than they were last year when we were dealing with the immediate post-COVID effect. And then right now, I'm much less concerned about the meat alternative meat replacement discussion than I was maybe two years ago. I think that first range of plant based um, products has, has settled. They're still growing. They're still taking uh, some of the market, but they're not really taking market share. And we look to the future to about five years ahead when cell base will become a more normalized product in the market and try and think about what that might look like. So those things today sit on my brain quite heavily and, and shape our forecasts, my team's forecasts as we work around the world. Food inflation is worth coming back to because it has a very real impact on how how people buy meat um, and especially how they buy beef, beef being one of the, the more expensive regular meat purchases in the basket. And the reason for showing you this is to show you that we're not alone in Europe. Uh, we see food inflation here in, in 2022 from compared to 2021 and then 2023 in the in the blue bar. And we see that food inflation is lower uh, globally than it was uh, in 2022, but it's still very high. European food inflation here running at 9% as opposed to nearly 13%. Uh, last year but that's still well above what the consumers are used to and certainly for the first half of the year was above our uh, wage inflation so we see consumers feeling genuinely poorer the reason for showing you that this basket of asian countries is that they represent some of your better export markets not so much for beef although some beef goes there but for pork and other products and we see that same trend rep repeated around the world consumers are feeling poorer and that result is they tend to downtrade. They buy maybe lower volumes or they buy lower quality. And that's a challenge, obviously, for, for beef sales going forward. In terms of sustainability, it's worth coming back to because I think the industry is, is beginning to try and represent itself a bit better uh, and try to showcase um, what the industry can do, how it can be part of this story towards. And, and really, the story beginning to be told is about net zero. There is some challenges. We know people like the NGOs continue to beat the drum about all livestock bad. The meat and livestock industry has been maybe a little slow in, in coming forwards in defence because it's wanted to get the science based argument right. It, it can't come in from a, a non substantiated position. But we're beginning to see that that position change. The reality is that the meat is an important part of affordable food. And you'll notice that the UN Sustainable um, Development Goals on the side there, that the number two one is zero hunger. Meat is part of that, a part of a balanced diet. So we we have to play to our strengths. Politicians, on the other hand, are less ready to rock the boat. Food security is important in the developing world, but in Europe is largely taken as a given. And so we have to have a, a better discussion about how we deliver um, from a from a especially from a cattle based point of view. But things like the Dublin Agreement have been good a good step to, towards starting that conversation at a really serious level. The last thing I want to do in this section is just to, to give you some perspective on the meat industry, because it's very easy to kind of go, well, it, it's all negative and it's all bad. But the reality is that if we go back, this is our data going back over a decade, it shows the growth in total meat production across what we would consider the four main categories, beef, sheep, meat, pork, poultry. And really, year on year growth between one and a half and two and a half percent. The only negative years in the middle here were um, were African swine fever reducing pork production in Asia. But otherwise, overall meat demand globally and consumption have continued to grow. It's mainly been about pork and chicken. 
But even beef at the global level has continued to grow and at our projections out to 2027 continues to grow. So we're talking about another 4 million tonnes of beef consumption there by the time we get out to 2027. So the underlying fundamentals are good for meat consumption growth. The challenges are about how we produce it and how do we make sure we make you know profitable uh, and sustainable in terms of a business environment rather than just environmental conversation. So that's the big picture stuff. Global meat, we tend to look at four markets when we're worrying about the, the day-to-day. And when we do our annual forecast, we work country by country around the world through places like Argentina and Uruguay, Africa, Middle East, India, all sorts of other bits. But in, in terms of the big picture, China, the US, Europe, including the UK and Brazil, represent the key markets for us. And you can see there, these show us um, the total production volume, and then we're showing the change into 2023. And so the important one is that although China continues to grow, it can't keep up with its demand outlook. And in the US and Europe, we're seeing a decline in production. In the US, it's because of drought. Culling in 2021 and 22 means that we've seen less animals coming through for slaughter or, or to go on to feedlot and then for slaughter this year. And then that story continues on into 2024. So we're going to see less beef out of the US next year. In the European situation, then we're seeing a similar but a different set of logic. So same kind of decline. But for us, that decline goes back over a 10-year period. It's tied back to the significant dairy base that we have in our breeding herd. We see more efficient cows uh, producing more milk and therefore less cows are needed for the milk supply. But we're also seeing the implementation of greening and sustainability criteria that make it harder to grow uh, herds and expand single farm sites. And that really continues to drive the decline in European beef production. And it's varies country by country. Expectation in the forecast is for that to continue. Brazil stands out here as being different. It's at the top of its cattle cycle. Weather has allowed them to rebuild. Um, and you see a 5% growth in their production. More Brazilian beef on the world market this year at lower prices and more competitive. And what for me becomes interesting is if we flip that over and, and we add one more on, which is to look at Australia, and I'll show you that on the price slide now, then I haven't got Australian production, but Australian production is up strongly this year. Um, and in fact, their production cycle is expected to peak next year. So like uh, Brazil, we see more Australian beef on the world market. And that's driven down the Australian price. And you see that in this, this purple line here. These are monthly prices, uh, monthly producer prices, and that, that Australian price down strongly competitive ad export around the world he markets in asia very little influence from it to date in the european market because they haven't had a lot of quota but as we look into 2024 and we think about the uk fta with australia then we can expect to see more australian beef in the uk market as a result elsewhere you can see the effect of drought on the us price pushing it up to record levels and that'll us beef price really very expensive on the world market today and that helps offset some of the Australian increase in supply. And the European price trending down really through the, the second half of the year, reflecting slightly weaker demand, but also beef coming from a very high price point. Um, and I think we're beginning to get, to get some genuine consumer resistance there. So that's the sort of the, the big picture in terms of where the European market is at. And, and the last bit of this for me on the European side is, trying to understand how much of that margin we managed to push through to retail. And I think when I speak to the retailers and I speak to the industry in between, they've paid higher prices to make sure that they've got European origin beef to put on the shelves. And that means they've had to give up margin to do that. Um, and, and I'm sure some of you will feel that's probably about time. Um, but, you know, my view is that for the, for the whole industry to be sustainable, then everyone needs to make money at the same time, we can't continue to have these swings. And so you see the retailers taking more of an interest in their, you know, what's going on up the supply chain from them and, and thinking about their midterm investments as to how they make sure that they, they have beef in the future. I just want to say a, a short word here on really on, on where beef is traded around the world, because the ability to move beef is a big part of valorizing the carcass. It's absolutely key um, for the European industry to get a bigger share of these Asian markets. And so what we show here is the key beef or total beef imports by who it is that imports that beef around the world. And the yellow colors in this are the Asian markets. And we're going from 2020 to a, a forecast on 2023 because we haven't finished the year yet. 
And you see that we've got stronger um, volumes into the Asian markets, notably into other Asia. And despite some, some economic weakness there that slowed that down a bit, demand continues to grow. Places like the Philippines looking for more manufacturing meat. We've got Japan and Korea in here who are buying high, higher quality products. And Europe's had a little less uh, competition from uh, from the US because of those high US prices. But primarily, it's Brazil that picks up the opportunity there. And then in here, it's just worth pulling out this black and white check is GB, the United Kingdom market. A notable importer of beef, about 400,000 tonnes per annum, a key market for, for Ireland very clearly. And they continue to need those volumes in the market to, to really control price to, to balance retail supply and for a big chunk of food service. And without getting lost in the detail here, it's I'll just pull out the European one for me. Uh, is an interesting one to look at, is where the European exporters export to. And you can see the GB at the bottom there, the United Kingdom market is the key export market. Um, it's, sorry, this is where it comes from. So the GB shipping into um, the European market alongside Argentina and Brazil. But this big share of GB is is that, you know, it, it's a, it's back to where we were within the European Union agreement in that we have a free trade agreement effectively uh, with the EU. And what we're doing is carcass balance. So we see more cold cow beef coming out of the, the UK market and moving into, into the mainland uh, EU market. And that's replaced by that import that comes in from Ireland and more prime cattle. And that's part of the story. And the Russian market continues to decline. Although if we put the chicken one up here, less interesting to you today, we see they've just opened a supply uh, an import quota the Russians, um, which will largely be supplied by Brazilian chicken, about 160,000 tons next year. So there is more beef being traded around the world. The Asian markets are really important and they help us with all sorts of bits of carcass balance. And that, that becomes the main story. So to keep within the time scope, I'm just going to flick quickly into a, an Irish focus. And, and I'm sure you've all seen an Irish beef balance. This just gives us an annual data. Setting up between imports here in red, consumption, which is the blue line, exports in green, and annual production in black. And really the point made here is that exports are absolutely key to the way the industry functions. You need to be competitive at export. And we see that in the pricing, obviously strong links into the UK and the rest, and, and then the mainland European market. And some expectation as we look into the next five-year period, looking out to 2028, that we see a small decline in production, in part due to those greeting measures that we're seeing. And that's reflected in both exports and consumption and imports holding about steady. So that's about what we'd expect to, to see. There's some uncertainty as to what happens with the next round of greening measures and how they're going to be implemented. There is an expectation that they will add costs to everybody, but also that, that Ireland is uniquely placed in that you, you have the natural capital to step forward and meet some of these and to have the production that meets these sustainable requirements. So I think there's, there's, there's some caution as we look at the Irish outlook, but also there's some, some real optimism that you are better placed in terms of your land mass and the environment to meet some of these challenges. So that, that for me becomes really interesting as we take on the, the next five years. The next step of that is, is just to think a little bit about um, how does it stack up on a price metric? And it's always very easy to go, well, hang on, the Irish price is below what we see in, in, in the UK price. So we've taken here uh, some some monthly beef producer prices. Uh, we've got the UK in the red line. We've got Ireland in the green line. That seems right. And then we've got Europe represented by the blue line. And they're averages, okay? So that it's, this isn't a perfect uh, piece of math I'm showing you. Now, notably, we had a, a really good trend up in those prices um, in the post-COVID period, driven by... Uh, a little renewed optimism in the market, but also we saw the input costs going up. And the reality was we had to pass those costs on. You see the UK price started to trend up before that. So the last part of this graph is at the bottom, we show you the margin difference between the UK price and the Irish producer, average producer price. And if we went back, you know, pre-COVID, we were used to that differential being about 500 euros a ton carcass weight. That was sort of where it is. And we started this year pretty low. The prices have got close together. But what for me has been really clear is the, the way those prices have developed this year. The UK is clearly shorter slaughter cattle. We're seeing very high prices for those. So the difference has grown to a thousand euros a ton. 
Uh, and you see that represented by the fact that really the, the UK red line grew in the first quarter of the year and then stabilised largely through the rest of the year. Whereas the Irish price has, has fallen away in the second half of the year, perhaps reflecting that there's a little more supply in the market. Uh, and in part that those uh, those food service outlets, uh, both in the UK and mainland Europe, are beginning to look a little bit harder at price and economics. And, and we see that there's a need to, to generate pull for the volumes by by keeping those prices competitive so i think that that producer price reflects that the net result of that gap the margin between the the irish and the uk prices that we should continue to see really good pull for irish beef exports both into the uk market and mainland of europe where it's positioned differently but it's that that difference with the uk price that i think is is absolutely key to driving it in fact you're underneath the european price again suggests that that should be important as well in terms of of the exports, then then it's just worth bearing in mind how those exports stack up. These are again monthly export volumes out of Ireland uh, of just beef carcass weight um, or beef carcass meat, sorry, uh, shown in product weight. So we're not showing any offal items in here. And you show that really between the UK and EU twenty seven, they are the the two major markets for it to move into, and that the UK has been relatively stable on volume through through the last year. And that trade remains promising. And Europe has been a little bit more variable, reflecting, I think, some of the, the demand side issues we've seen in Europe, but that overall prices have increased at export. So that's that's promising. And if we take a look at the offal trade, then we find the offal trade is down um, really since sort of the back end of 2020. And for me, that that reduction in the offal trade into mainland Europe represents and and the uk market represents some of the challenge um about carcass valorization and the pressure that we see put on the um the slaughter companies as to how do they justify some of those higher values we see in carcasses now part of that is down to demand but also some of this goes back to the labor discussion and i know that when i speak to various uh slaughter groups not just in europe or ireland but around the world that where we've had less labor one of the things we haven't been able to do is recover and valorize a whole range of offal products in the same way. So that challenge is, is very clear in the numbers. Uh, and it's a challenge for those slaughter line operators who, who can't maximize uh, the value of a carcass. Just very quickly on China. China for me is fascinating. Um, it, and we've been through this huge development in demand for beef in China, and they continue to, to move for more of it. I've, I've worked with China for 18 years. And you, and you see the the beef line is this green line running through here and the red line is the beef line. Sorry, it's like counter how, how it ought to be on normal grass. But the fundamentally over the last 10 years, that beef value has picked up really strongly. And you see it's been pretty much continuous. Now, if I if I had the latest data on here and we don't quite, then we see it's down just a little bit in both RMB and, and US dollar terms. But it's still much stronger than it was even five years ago. And that limits some of the demand upside that we can see in beef. But if I speak to the importers, I speak to the producers, and even despite the economic struggles we've seen this year, we continue to see more demand for beef into China. And the reality is they can't produce it themselves. They haven't got the infrastructure to do that. And so they've got to continue to look for more imported beef, both uh, fundamentally for food service, um, but we're also seeing some increased demand for, for some of the higher end retail outlets as well. And you see prime fed, U.S. grain fed and things like that um, taking some of the top spots in the market. The other thing you'll see in this chart is this big bubble up in the pork price here. This was African swine fever and the, the shortage of pork. Today, the prices are still they're back up from where they were. But the reality is that not at a profitable level. And, and that remains a challenge within the market. So challenges in in the the industry today fundamentally china needs to import more uh beef and you can see that so this is a more up-to-date chart showing uh chinese beef prices and for me it's really i'm um, sorry beef imports uh, and really striking that you know obviously the brazilians are very strong you can see both here at this dip in 2022 and the one here in 2023 were atypical bse and, and a temporary shutdown on on brazilian beef being allowed into china but those volumes month for month continue to grow, even in a year like 2023, where the economy struggled, we have seen more beef going in, albeit the red line at the top here shows you that those average import prices have come back down. So they're not as strong as perhaps we would like them to be. But the signal is good. China is still buying beef. They are still buying large volumes. And Ireland has some access 
and you can't pick it out because it's a tiny slice up here of grey. But those volumes, although in the you know the the total volume that goes to China aren't huge, they're really important to Ireland, and the opportunity to grow that volume is really interesting. So hope as we look into into the, the midterm, we'll see more Irish beef in China. A few final thoughts. You know, the UK beef market will remain a key market for you. It is absolutely, you know, uh, linked with the Irish industry. Unquestionably, we see the UK retailers give a, a very privileged position to Irish beef. And so that opportunity remains strong. And obviously, the difference of a thousand euros a ton is, is fundamental to that. Current short term impact of the cost of living crisis has not killed beef consumption. And when we looked at this last year, we were really concerned. I'm still fairly concerned that it, it's taken the, the best part of the edge off it. The retailers have struggled to pass costs on margin destruction in processing and retail to to allow that consumption to hold up. And that, for me, is one of the concerns as we look out into 2024 is whether we need to pull those retail prices back in a little bit to try and generate um, a bit more consumption. EU 27 wide regulation of the environmental impact of agriculture will further reduce cattle herds you know that that's not a it's not a popular statement anywhere but it's it is the reality it's likely to happen at a level beyond the loss of demand that's for me becomes really interesting so the expectation that that we are going to reduce european production in the best areas for production and that we're going to have to import some of that offset or the consumers are going to be forced to eat other meats and pay a, a more of a premium for the beef they get can Ireland make that a, a, you know, can they be the winners in this picture? Has, has Ireland got the ability to be really competitive here? Milk milk becomes an interesting part of this. And, you know, EU milk price is off the 2022 highs. I mean, there were some dairy farmers made very good money through 2022. The 2023 prices aren't terrible. I mean, they're still profitable, but they're not very profitable. And so cows retained in 2022 have been killed in 2023. That's led to an increase in manufacturing beef, but also it means we're going to see less calves in 2024 coming through for uh, being born, also coming through for beef in 2025, as we see a little bit of rebuilding over the next, well, 12 to 24 months in the beef industry. So I think that's important to bear in mind about where what we're looking at in prices is that we haven't got a glut of calves coming through, and that means we're not going to see a, a massive glut of beef to, to really pull down prices. EU prices are out of step with Europe, pointing to a shortage of slaughter animals in the UK. That's important. That Those animals just aren't there. That beef supply isn't there. You see that in the price. It will drive import demand in 2024. Primarily, that's going to focus on, on Irish beef coming in to the UK market. I'm a little bit concerned that it might open the door to seeing a little bit more Australian beef in the market as well. But despite the headwinds in beef, I mean, there are all sorts of things that we can sit here and talk about as being really negative. Demand is fundamentally still good. Consumers still like the product and we're still seeing it consumed. So there are lots of challenges, but I'm, I'm very largely positive about it. Um, and I think we're, we're in for another interesting year ahead. So thank you for, for your time. Thank you for listening. That's all for this week's episode. And further details of the presentations and proceedings from the Chagas National Beef Conference can be found on the Chagas website and the link is in the podcast text. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.